Hi, this is Eric Chase, the afternoon host on Cumulus Media Toledo's Q105 and your host for 68 Words. Welcome to this episode where our guest is someone who's been doing life-saving work in our community for over two decades. Her name is Allison Armstrong, as in Chief Armstrong of the Toledo Fire and Rescue. With pun intended, the Chief's been on fire since her recent rise to Chief. To getting and graduating so many new recruits, numerous community events, and a recent descent down the Key Bank building for the Victory Center. I wonder how she fits it all in. And that's in addition to the challenges she and her family have had with their son, Nicholas, his entire life. Most people have never heard of it. It's called cat eye syndrome. And what it is, is it's a genetic defect, which is uh, extra chrom- chromosomal material on one of the chromosomes that essentially caused a number of things to develop what I would say incompletely. So my son Nicholas is 14 and he has a lot of medical problems and disabilities related to um, the improper development of many aspects of his body. People, places, and spaces doing disability differently share first-hand experience in our podcast. Inspired by the 68 words that spoke the disability rights movement, learn where it started and what's next. Hi, my name is Stuart James and I'm the executive director here at the Ability Center and welcome to This is quite a a very special episode of 68 Words because the woman's voice that you hear to close every episode, uh, Chief Allison Armstrong, is actually today's guest. Um, Good morning. And when we wrap up, I'm not going to play the I won't stitch the credits in. I'm going to ask you to do it for memory. Oh, my gosh, Eric. Good morning. (laughs) And now you're going to leave, right? Um, you're here today because uh, actually there's there's three Chief Armstrongs. If anyone follows you on Twitter, they can only imagine that there's that many because there's no way you can possibly fit in all the events that you do and still do your job. You know, it's not that bad. I I make time for my family, I make time for the, the other things that I need to do, but I do enjoy my job and I do work a lot to make sure the men and women of the Fire and Rescue Department and the citizens of Toledo are taken care of. What a perfectly political answer. How many hours a day do you sleep? I do like my sleep, so I go to bed early. I usually sleep What's early? six to eight hours, like nine o'clock. That's not too bad. At our age, that's, that's actually kind of late. Um, you're here because you have a son with a disability, correct? I do. Um, and forgive me, um, it's not a common one if I remember, because I keep forgetting what it is when you tell me. So can you tell all of our 68 Words listeners what it is and how it impacted your life from the first day being a mom with him and, 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 and so forth? I can. So most people have never heard of it. It's called cat eye syndrome. And what it is, is it's a chromosomal, it's a genetic defect, which is uh, extra chrom- chromosomal material on one of the chromosomes that essentially caused a number of things to develop what I would say incompletely. So my son Nicholas is 14 and he has a lot of medical problems and disabilities related to um, the improper development of many aspects of his body. Let's let's start at the very beginning. When did you find out that this was the case? Was it, uh, when he was in the womb? Yes, so we went for the 20 week ultrasound and you know at that time, they look for certain things, and what they saw was they didn't see four chambers of the heart. So that led them to send us to a neonatologist and then a pediatric cardiologist. And the focus then was on the heart because that's all we knew. We didn't have genetic testing or anything because I figured at that point we knew there was a problem and we would figure it out when mm-hmm. I, we had him. And so there was nothing that could be done ahead of time. Um, it was something they closely monitored and we knew when he was born that he would have to go to the NICU and we knew that he would have to have heart surgeries. Did, uh, was there any other foresight given to you about um, developmental disabilities at certain ages? Not at that time. So at the time that I was pregnant with them, we only knew about the heart problem. They were suspicious. Mm-hmm. There could be other problems. They did offer, you know, amnio or the genetic testing and whatnot. But like I said, there was a risk for that. And I just thought, why bother? We'll figure it out once he's born. And then once he was born, it was apparent that he had other medical problems, like was born with imperfect anus. So he didn't have an anal opening. He had ear pits. His ears were malformed. So that led them to believe that there was a genetic problem. And then he went through testing to determine what that problem was and ultimately the diagnosis was cat eye syndrome you had the you had the attitude of we'll, we'll handle it we'll handle it um you're obviously a very strong woman um 
when you began to get these diagnoses and see these problems, how overwhelming was it for you? It was extremely overwhelming because, as you can imagine, he was in the hospital in the NICU. Uh, he had to have emergency surgery for the bowel issue because if you don't have an anal opening, then everything backs up into your belly and that becomes an emergency. I think we can visualize mm. that, yes. Sounds. Right, and to, for a newborn, I mean, it's very apparent because they're so small. And so his belly started getting distended and they said, hey, we have to take him for emergency surgery. And it was, he was two days old. Mm -hmm. And they put a colostomy in. So then we're in the NICU, they start doing the genetic testing, and one of the frustrating things, and I, and I understand it, was that the nurses would talk about it. They would say, oh, we think he has this, or we think he has that, mm. and, and it was just too much to process. I mean, we're sitting here with our child in the NICU, you know, very sick, not knowing what's going on, knowing that his heart is not working correctly either, and that could kill him at any moment in time, and that he needed heart surgery, but he couldn't have heart surgery because he needed emergency bowel surgery. Right. And, He's less than a week old, so I just we had to tune that stuff out because it's just too much to comprehend, and, and then you start thinking of all the what ifs, and then you start thinking, is my child gonna live? And I just, we couldn't do that. We had to make sure he was taken care of and just take things as they come and, and have an attitude that, you know, we'll manage these things as we know what they are. So this is about, four, this was about 14 years ago, right? Yes. Um, what was your position uh, and role on the force at that time? So that was 2008, and in 2008, I, well, so I went to paramedic school when I was pregnant with Nicholas. So if you back up, I was already a registered nurse. I was already licensed as a registered nurse in the state of Ohio. Uh, we were doing paramedic school within the Toledo Fire and Rescue Department, and we went to a 40-hour week. Instead of a 24-hour schedule, uh, we would move to a 40-hour week to, to do that training. And so it worked out because I was pregnant, and they offered the training, and I thought, well, this is great. I can go to paramedic school and still do that while I'm pregnant. And so I finished paramedic school in May and he was born in July. So uh, let's jump back ahead after some of his surgeries. When did you begin to see some of the, the, the light and the clearing and then get some clarity of what his life would be like as, as an infant and then a toddler? <clears throat> it was tough. The first three years was very tough. In the first three years he had three open heart surgeries, three major bowel surgeries. He had a feeding tube put in. We were told that he can't hear, so we didn't know if he was deaf. He didn't hit any of the milestones that, that you know a typical child would hit. So it was tough, and we really didn't get a sense for things, the idea that things were going to be okay probably till he was three. Did any doctors give you any clarity at all, like where this was going, or was this so rare and they just didn't know what was going to happen to him as he got older by the months actually yeah they didn't know I, this is a rare syndrome and if you look up the list of symptoms it's very long and and diverse and so you could have a couple of these symptoms you could have all of them or anything in between and so the biggest concern for us was his heart right mm -hmm. and so th to me that was the the thing that was going to cause the most problems for him and or kill him and in between that first and second heart surgery because what they do is like a temporary shunt so that the heart can function and supply blood to the rest of the body it's it's not a fix it is a temporary measure until they can have the next surgery so he had surgery at a week he had surgery six months and then surgery at just under three years so between that that one week and six months he was at high risk for sudden cardiac death what was care like for him when when he wasn't in surgery and he was at home <clears throat> it was a lot because he had a feeding tube he had a colostomy we had to constantly monitor his weight his fluid he was on lasix you know diuretic we had to monitor his pulse ox saturations to make sure that they didn't uh, drop to where we needed to go and find out you know what's going on like did the shunt close things like that that maybe not have been readily apparent just by looking at him he didn't, uh, he didn't sleep a lot, he cried a lot. So it was anything but typical, but we had in-home nursing care right. for some of that, which was a godsend. But then also my husband and I uh, worked opposite shifts. He's a, he was a firefighter also. We work opposite 24 hour shifts so that one of us was always home with our son that could tend to any medical needs or appointments or anything he needed. Did the stress of thinking about him and whatever was going to happen to him, um, how heavily did that weigh on you and where you wanted to go with your career tra trajectory? 
it was hard. It was really, really hard. And there was a point where I didn't know if I should continue doing this job. Right. Because of the stress, because of the time away, the shifts that we worked, and where I wondered if I should just leave and go to like a normal job or schedule in order to take care of my son. Mm -hmm. Um, When he got to three years old, seems like there was, there was some, that was the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, Did he maybe turn into a a, a kind of a normal little boy at that point? The surgeries were behind him. What happened when he got to that toddler age? Yeah. So he, he didn't eat also. So back up, he had a feeding tube, so he never really drank a bottle. He couldn't drink a bottle. It's a common problem with kids with heart problems um, that end up in the hospital like that. And they warned us that would probably be an issue, but I don't want to believe it. I figured, how hard is it? You know, you figure it out. But once he got old enough to start eating, uh, you know, regular foods and things like that, taking things by mouth, it got easier. And then he started walking. He started talking. I mean, those things are all very delayed. So right. then when he started doing those things... And, you know, the, the surgeries and the doctor's appointments were further um, in between each other. Then we had more of a, a normal life, so to speak, and, and he was able to do things that a child that age could do. So that gave us hope for the future. When he hit that age, um, what was the first thing you attended or a place you went or Aaron you ran and you, you kind of took a, a breath of relief that things were beginning to get a little bit normal? I don't remember um, a specific thing, but if you if we back up a little bit, we started taking him on vacation at six months, nine months old, because my feeling was we don't know what the future holds, and none of us do on a good day, let alone uh, somebody with those types of medical problems. And so uh, we started doing those things at a young age and just trying to enjoy time together and, and do things as a family. And so, you know, we've done that his whole life. And, and those are the type of things that we do to, I want to say, to, to have normal lives, right? And, right? and to spend time with each other and things like that instead of, you know, wondering about the what ifs and sitting home. Um, Waiting thinking. for something bad to happen. Right, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Because your motto is, and I think you've said it three times now, we'll figure it out. Figure it out. And I'm, I'm much the same way as well. That's why we get along. Um, so he he turns into a, a little boy, he gets past toddler. He's five, six, seven, eight, nine years old. What's life like with him then? Are most of that that the serious health concerns behind him? No. I mean, so <clears throat> if your heart doesn't work properly, uh, it will continue to not work properly in most cases. And, and with So what he has is hypoplastic right heart syndrome, which means the right side of the heart did not develop. Therefore, it does not work. And so the surgeries they did were to essentially bypass that side of the heart. But those surgeries have other side effects. Mm -hmm. And so they cause other problems and the heart still goes into failure. So um, it's it's hard for him to run around. So he could not, uh, you know, run a marathon, right? Because his perfusion is not such that he would be able to do something like that. But he did play hockey for a little while. He can play basketball and things like that. He'll have to take breaks, but the, the other issue that was difficult is hearing loss. Mm-hmm. So he had moderate to severe hearing loss in both ears. And so going through that process of trying to get fitted for hearing aids, hearing tests, and trying to navigate that while you're having major heart surgeries and ICU stays and all this other stuff, it kind of took a backseat. So it took us a little while to get hearing aids for him and so that delayed his speech and you know caused some other problems and then at school you know having to navigate the IEP process and making sure that the school is taking care of you know the things that he needs from a therapy standpoint from an equipment and communication standpoint you know that was a lot of work and things that most people don't have to navigate so going through that was I mean we learned a lot how about how about him just being a kid with those uh, developmental delays and issues uh, and challenges? What was it like for him to just socialize with other kids? Was there was there teasing? Was there bullying that he had to deal with? There is. I mean, we, we would be out sometimes, and and people would make comments, or, or other kids would say things, and that was hard at the time. My son didn't know any different, so mm-hmm. I don't think he picked up on it. I but think it bugged it, you, our, my husband and I. It bothered us, and, yeah. and we noticed, but. No, I mean, I, I think at that point he he did the things that he wanted to do and, and we never held him back from anything. We encouraged him to be a kid, have friends, uh, go play, 
and he was able to do most of that. So. Was there was there ever a point as he got older where he did feel different or singled out? He's never mentioned anything, no. Good. Um, so what's life like now for Nicholas at 14 years old? Nicholas is in eighth grade, and he has a couple friends that he's very close with, that they hang out with. He does the things that a typical 14-year-old does, go to football games or ride his bike to his friend's house and things like that. So um, the hearing aid thing is a challenge, right? He doesn't want to wear hearing aids because he doesn't have to. He thinks he can hear fine. So, you would say otherwise, <clears throat> like clean your room, do your chores. Yeah, or when we're watching TV and he he's like, turn it up, turn it up. I said, I thought you could hear it. But he does, uh, he gets by. And so. Um, how, how has maybe before you became a mom to Nicholas, how has your pers- perspective drastically changed from a parent who might not have these challenges to one that went through all of them? You know, it did a lot of things for me, both personally and professionally. It made me realize that I was probably focusing on the wrong things in life, right? And so to that extent, it made me appreciate the things that we have. It made me appreciate time with my family. It made me the person I am today that's like, you know what, I'll figure it out. Right. I don't sweat the small stuff. I don't get upset about, um, I'll say the small stuff. And I take the attitude that we'll take things as they come and we'll figure it out. Um, professionally speaking, how did being his mom and going through all of this make you better at what you do? It, it made me more empathetic to people that are dealing with either things like this or anything because at the end of the day we don't know what people are dealing with in their lives and so at work if somebody calls 911 and we show up you know we need to assess the problem we need to provide care for that person but we need to do it with also being empathetic to their situation realizing their situation is not our situation Mm -hmm. so it made me a better healthcare provider better firefighter better mom um have you been on many calls in your career where you have needed to tend to somebody with a disability? Um, and what is that experience like? And what's that experience like now for current firefighters who might answer those calls? Yeah, the answer is yes. We, we go on a lot of EMS calls, fire calls, other types of calls, and we interact with all facets of the public. And so, you know, some of those populations are more vulnerable mm-hmm. and, and sometimes people with disabilities fall in that category. And so we, we train our people, our, the firefighters, to be able to interact with all people and be able to, to realize that not everybody's like you and not everybody has the same abilities or the same resources or the same family structure and things like that. And so, you know, it's our job to fully assess the situation and, and treat and transport them if they need that and or connect them with services in the community. Um, Had you been on enough calls with people who had some type of disability where you might have seen a common thread and you were able to offer some advice? And and I'll use the example of, and it's actually good timing because I think you guys are giving out um, free fire alarms and smoke alarms and how vital they are and how many problems those could solve. We talked about that before. Um, Is there a general piece of advice for people with any kind of disability um, that they might want to put in their toolkit? so that it's a little easier for them and they might be able to get through some situations. The other thing we talked about is people making sure their medications are up to date because people have called you about that. So people with disabilities, are, is there a common thread where the community or they could help themselves? Is that a hard question? That is such a, multi, <laughs> that's such a broad and multifaceted yeah. question. I don't know where to go with it. Um, if the answer is no, that's totally fine because everyone is an individual and everyone has right. their own challenges. But... That's why I wanted to ask the question. If there's no answer, there's no answer. I wouldn't say that there's no answer. I just don't know which answer to provide you. So Sure enough. So for us, there's a couple of things that, that come to mind. So if, if you're going to call 911 or interact with the 911 system, then, you know, for us, what we need people to do is just, you know, be straightforward and, and give us, you know, the information about their health or their disability that may affect the care that we're providing at that time. So there's that. And then the other part of it is you're talking about smoke alarms. So yes, we provide smoke alarms to the community. However, if you're you know hard of hearing, then we have ones that, that are bed knockers and that are adaptive for you know those clients or those people in the community that need that sort of thing. So I guess the general message for me is we want everybody to feel included and we want to be inclusive. So if 
you know, we have a program or if we have something like the smoke alarms that we're giving away and, and you need something different, then just ask us. You know, if we can help you, we absolutely will. Or we'll connect you to the resource that can because we don't want anybody to be excluded. That's exactly, uh, that. that's a perfect answer. And that's why I ask some of these questions where it makes me seem, if you don't, listen correctly. I might come off as sounding really ignorant and dumb, but I'm asking these questions because you gave the answer that will likely help somebody. I didn't know that there were, were louder. Sm- Did you call it a bed knocker? They, yeah. So they're, yeah. <laughs> so it mounts to the bed to shake it, right. right? In order to alert somebody that is deaf or hard of hearing. Right. There's yeah. strobes. There's, there's different devices out there. And just because we offer one, there are other ones um, for those populations. Um, being a, a mom with a son who had all these uh, challenges and developmental delays, but also being a firefighter, do you look at, at, at places you go with different perspectives now? Um, one is the fire chief thinking, well, that's not very safe, but also that's not very accessible either. I do, right? So it's all about perspective. And so your perspective changes once you have to, you know, um, care for a child that has these needs and then realize that, you know, their environment may, may not be best suited to them. So, yes, I do notice those things as a mother of a child with um, special needs, medical needs. But then as the fire chief, 100 yeah. percent. You know, I like exits that are open and, you know, lights and, you know, things like that. If I'm in a place, I'm looking for the exits so that if something happens, you know, people know how to get out. Uh, it, you look at the world differently, sure. for sure. And I think we, I think we all do that, uh, regardless of what our what our jobs may be. Um, do you? And the answer you might not know the answer to this question because it's private medical information. Do you know of any firefighters who have a disability? I'm sure there are. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I can't think of specifics offhand. It might be the the kind that we sometimes talk about the invisible disabilities, right. a mental health issue. Um, but I just was curious of that. The, the other thing I wanted to ask you, um, when you've been on calls in your career, um, being empathetic, uh, being through what you've been through, um, some people's lives are going to change drastically after some, some calls you've been on. Um, there might be physical damage to the house. There might be physical damage to their bodies where I think we talk about three, three kinds of disabilities born with it. Um, uh, the invisible kind or the acquired kind. You ever think of this ever go through your head? Has it been through your head where someone's been through a horrific, horrific situation on a call you've been on and you realize that that person will now have a disability because of whatever incident that was? You know, I'll be honest. I never thought about it in those terms, but certainly I've been on those incidents where that is absolutely the case. You know, people, if we've, uh, the latest one I can think about is pulling somebody out of a fire. You know, somebody that suffered smoke inhalation, somebody that is now burned and disfigured, uh, and, you know, their life will change forever. Mm -hmm. And then we also have, you know, car accidents or other injuries. You know, those are the types of incidents that usually something like that would come to mind. Yeah. Well, now you'll think about that when you go on calls. <laughs> um, in that in that vein, what are some resources that you personally and professionally have found um, like to help your son and for others like him in our community? So I always tell people, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And if you haven't been exposed to things, then uh, you just you don't know what's out there or what can be offered. But when Nicholas was in the hospital, the social worker met with us and provided tons of resources to assist us that I never knew existed, like um, early intervention specialists. Um, there were some other things, and I, and I can't think of the names of them. There was a program, I think, through Medicaid or Job and Family Services that they connected us with that provided, and I don't know if it still exists, but it provided funding to buy things that insurance didn't pay for. Because there's a lot of things, and this is the other thing that people don't realize, there's a lot of things that insurance simply doesn't pay for that mm-hmm. we need. Yeah. And, and, and the weird thing is they're medical supplies, but yet they're not covered under insurance or hearing aids. You know, for my health plan only covered one hearing aid, lifetime max, that's it. So if you need that stuff beyond there, it's self-pay. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there are some resources that will provide funding for those sorts of things. And that was really helpful to us. And then making sure that he had intervention specialists to work with him, to connect us with physical therapy, occupational therapy, the feeding therapy, all this stuff to ensure that he could eventually meet the milestones of an infant and toddler 
that was huge for us because that set him on a path to success. And if we didn't have that early on, who knows what would have happened in terms of walking, talking, mm -hmm. all those things, hearing, speech. Um, let's uh, let's switch gears a little bit. And thanks for talking about so much of that and your son and your family life. Uh, let's let's run down as we wrap up here in a couple of minutes. Um, some of the basics. We talked about smoke alarms. What are some other basics that would make your job a lot easier? Um, we talked about this on my podcast. Some some basics. We talked about the medications, things that you you kind of wish people knew, but maybe we overlook, but are easy to solve. So the majority of the incidents that we respond to are EMS in nature, and, and it varies anywhere between 80 and 90%. You know, we're a fire and rescue department, but we provide EMS, and that is the bulk of what we do. So from an EMS standpoint, or even a fire standpoint, having, you know, your address on your house so that we can find it, you know, lights, that type of thing. And then with the medications, everybody needs to have a medication list. And, and if you're not feeling well and EMS shows up, instead of you trying to remember which medications you're on, if you have a list, you can just hand us and have copies of it so we can take it with us. That's really important because when we're assessing you and treating you, we need that information to make a full assessment. So that's important from a fire standpoint the smoke alarms, making sure that they're working, um, making sure that when you're cooking, you know, you do it safely. Don't leave hot oil unattended. Don't put water on hot oil. It'll start, it'll splatter and cause either a fire or cause burns, things like that, smoking. So we've seen a lot of incidents this year where fires were caused because of discarded smoking materials. And mm -hmm. in several instances, people they were fatalities. People were killed. Yeah. Smoking with oxygen on, that's, mm. that's been a huge problem can't smoke with oxygen on it is a flammable gas right so things like that and then you know reducing clutter in your house when we talk about the elderly population or you know people with disabilities or you know visual loss things like that making sure that it's not cluttered so you don't fall you know handrails on steps we don't want we don't want to see falls in those types of injuries especially in the elderly population so those are things you can easily fix uh to ensure that people stay safe what's been your uh you've been chief now six seven eight months or you forgot did we both eight, forget a little over eight months what's been your favorite thing so far other than going over the edge <laughs> that was fun I really like interacting with people. I like interacting with the community. I like being in this position to affect change, right? And to actually, you know, see the change move forward and propel the organization forward. Um, I just think it's a good fit. Have what's been what's been uh, a small challenge because it's it's hard to achieve goals in such a short period of time. Is there a, a small goal or maybe even a big one that you've you've checked off the list so far? So, I mean, the hiring, uh, I hired 70 people since I've become chief. We're starting the hire process for the next class. We've been able to purchase much needed equipment like cardiac monitors, a ladder truck. We're purchasing air apparatus now, so the, the self-contained breathing apparatus that we use. So one of the biggest, I don't want to say struggles, but <clears throat> the thing that's going to take a lot of time and energy is coming up with a sustainable replacement plan for our fire stations. So we're actively working on that, but that's something that, you know, will take funding, it'll take time, and I'm confident we can get there. We just don't have a long-term plan for that right now. Are there... Are there ideas out there? Like, is there a firehouse of the future that has been floated in some Elon Musk kind of fantasy world? You know what? That is a great question, Eric, and I'm happy to answer what we are looking at doing. So I don't know if you know, the city of Toledo had that water emergency, right? And out of that came a study and they have to build water towers. So I believe they're looking at three water towers and the first one is going to go in South Toledo. And we are actually looking at the feasibility of putting a fire station in the base of the water tower because otherwise it's kind of wasted space they're building it anyways it's in a good location and so we are pursuing that right now um, as a means to build a new station within that water tower and do it more cost effective sure um all right some of the fun things even though you brought up the firehouse and i asked you this before and you you politically dodged it but you've been on the job longer now and somebody's always got to come in all last right. e even if the last place team is good somebody's still got to miss the playoffs what's your favorite firehouse i will finally answer your question thank you 
It is Fire Station 17 on Central near Jeep Parkway. Okay. And I say that because that is the station that I was captain of for five and a half years. Um, that was the place I held a bid the longest. And it's an amazing station with an amazing crew on all three shifts because it's one of the busiest engines and lighter trucks in the city. They go to a lot of different runs. They cover a large portion of the expressway, go to a lot of fires. It's a very active station. So I'm going to go Station 17, Bulldogs. Good enough. Um, is there... A place you've been to while you've been chief that maybe you didn't have access to before, um, maybe you didn't want to go to before, but because the chief has certain duties, can you give me one of those places that you've been in your tenure? I don't have a place, but you mentioned over the edge, and that's probably one of those mm-hmm. things that, I mean, if I wasn't fire chief, I don't think anybody would have been calling me to, to come do that. So I, I would say that event itself was one of those things. Great event, great event. It raised a lot of money. Absolutely. Um, favorite restaurant? I'm gonna go with real seafood. Okay. Um, what are the other light questions here? How do you uh, how do you detach and shut your brain off? Uh, and you can't answer walleye, because I have separate walleye questions. So how do you shut your brain off? I can't. <laughs> Okay, so and this is why we get along. Like, I can't watch mindless TV. I want to watch something that will send me down a Wikipedia hole. So what wires your brain but isn't work-related? Not hockey. Why can't I say hockey, A book, Eric? a show. I do like books. Okay, so I like books. I like books, and I do like some TV shows. So my son's been making me watch Stranger Things lately. Okay. I don't know if you've seen it. I know Stranger Things. It's, uh, I'm not yeah. that uncool. Well, it's interesting. Um, I like books about history. I like, I don't know if this is strange or not, I like books about like wartime nursing. I, I'm sure. into that sort of thing. Florence oh. Nightingale? Yes. Is, is she the nurse? Yes. Started, what did she start the Red Cross? Is my history right? I don't, I'm not good at history. Okay. Maybe. Um, I like... Th- Books about aviation or maritime stuff. I, I don't know why, but I just I like totally that sort fine. Of thing. Um, you you love you love walleye games. You love hockey. Um, you you have season tickets, right? We have the nine game package. Okay. If uh, if somebody saw you at a game um, acting kind of wild, like out uh, very unchiefly, what would cause that? Like uh, a penalty that wasn't called, a goal disallowed, and have you ever acted like that before? And I, I've never acted like that. <laughs> no, well, you're right. If you did, you now have to stop. Unless there's evidence, I've never acted like that. Right, 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 right. What gets you fired up at a hockey game then? In, in a good way, in a good way. <laughs> so... Uh, some of the things that you mentioned, I mean, what gets me fired up at, at a hockey game is, you know, a good solid game, right? Not, you know, cheap shots, but like exciting goals or runs or, you know, maybe a fight depending on the situation. Um, but I would say like an exciting goal or maybe, you know, a big game if there's a tie and then, you know, the wall I score, I'd be pretty excited about that. Um there was another uh, Kelly Cup run last year. They've gotten so close in like the last five years, several different times, and it coincided with like you knocking the first couple of months out of your uh, your chiefship. Um, and I had asked you this at the time: How hard was it to navigate following that playoff run while trying to be the chief of uh, of uh, TFRD in Toledo? It wasn't that hard, Eric, because I love hockey. And you make time uh, I, for it? I went to all the playoff games that, uh, that I could. I think I missed one because we were out of town or whatnot. But I plan my schedule around that. And because the games are in the evening, it makes it easier. Mm-hmm. Wait, wasn't there? There was one time, though, I remember it was, it was like May or June. And I was watching Twitter and something happened that I knew you were at the game and you got called out of the game, didn't you? Or you had to go tend to something? That does happen. It does yes. happen. Yeah, because you can't shut your phone off. I mean, well, I could, <laughs> but I don't. No, we don't want two chief openings in Toledo. Uh, chief Allison Armstrong, thanks so much for visiting. Do you want to do the closing credits or should I run the recorded version? I'll go ahead and run the recorded version because uh, I forgot what it was. This is Chief Armstrong of Toledo Fire and Rescue. 68 Words has been a production of the Ability Center, hosted by Cumulus Media's Eric Chase. Engineering provided by Will Mellon and executive produced by Mallory Crooks. If you, your group, organization, or business is interested in hosting a disability awareness experience or have other inquiries, please contact info at abilitycenter.org. Until next time, think differently. Think differently. Think differently.